Over the last several weeks, this world has seen things it has never seen before. And folks, make no mistake, the world is about to be shocked once again. All right, folks, let's get into this. First and foremost, I have to say this. We need to get into a little bit of what has happened over the last few weeks. And as we do that, I want to lead into what I believe is coming. And folks, I am telling you, it is going to take the world by surprise. Why? Because we don't learn from the past and undoubtedly we don't take the time to learn from the scriptures, especially as it relates to Bible prophecy. And so much of what we're seeing materializing in front of us is absolutely related to those very things. Now, we have to go back as early as what happened prior to the attempted assassination on President Trump. President Trump did some very historic things. I will say this, not so much things that I like and I'm uh, blessed with, but one thing is certain, he was able to convince the Republican National Committee to change its language on the subject of sexuality, to change its language on the subject of abortion, and to make all kinds of other concessions let me just simply say are ungodly and absolutely terrible. Now, I think it's interesting because we spent a lot of time talking about how the devil works. The devil will use you for a very specific purpose. And once he accomplishes his purpose, he will dispose of you. That's what he does. And that's exactly what happened. And it's exactly why this last few weeks have been absolutely historic. Why? Because the very moment that the Republican National Committee chose to vote on changing the language and successfully did so based on the leadership of President Trump. And by the way, I will concede to the fact that that was because he has people in his ear trying to help him be successful in his campaign so that he could get voted into office. But once they did that, the devil was done with Trump for the moment. So what happens? A day and a half later, they attempt to take his life. And folks, I'm going to simply say this. When we look at the details of the attempted assassination, I have so many questions in my mind. I do not think that this was a simple matter of incompetence. This is something that was orchestrated. It was chaotic for a lot of reasons. Folks, they don't have recordings of the Secret Service radio conversations. They don't have recordings of the uh, body cams from the local police department. The local police department talked about the fact that they had this a massive meeting, a gathering the morning of the, uh, the rally and the United States Secret Service didn't show up. The agent that they had in charge of the United States Secret Service for that specific rally was somebody that they bought in at the last minute. We have it confirmed now there were three different weapons that were heard in the audio forensics of the shooting. You've got a guy who was standing at a water tower that was clearly very, very involved in everything that had happened. You've got this nonsense with this uh, Secret Service agent who finally took the kill shot, who was the sniper, who said that the reason why he delayed in actually shooting the assassin was because he had to take the time to deconflict the actual sniper that he saw who happened to be the assassin because they had no idea whether or not he was actually an agent or a police officer. The problem is they would have totally known what was the case if they went to the meeting that discussed all of that. They talked about the fact that there were no frequencies that they were aware of, where one was communicating to the other, so communication was broken. And then let's not forget it, but when the president was actually shot, look at the way that they handled that mess, right down to the way that they brought him in the vehicle to get him out of the situation. And yes, I will say that President Trump was bold and heroic, and it was remarkable to see how he reacted. But folks, it was absolutely crazy. Then we get into the Republican National Committee conference, which of course was a big success in a lot of people's minds in a lot of ways. So one of the areas in which it, it was just, it took off is when this attorney got up there and basically decided that she was going to end up doing this weird, just insane prayer to a God who is not the God of heaven, to the God who did not create the United States of America. And it's crazy that they allowed her to be able to do this. They prayed, she prayed to somebody who she called the creator of the United States of America when we know it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then you have a porn star show up to actually uh, represent the Republican National Committee? I mean, folks, come on, let's get with it. This was a very, very spiritual week. There was a lot of warfare going on, really ugly. 
And then we have this situation with respect to what happened with President Biden. And when you think of the details associated with that and them trying to get rid of him and saying he needs to go, and who knows if he's even alive, quite frankly. I know they say he's appeared here and appeared there. He's probably got some stunt double. I'm trying to be a little sarcastic with all of this, but it's kind of bad when you think about it. And when you stop to listen to the things that he said and the words that are coming in from all kinds of people around the world talking about how bad his sickness began to affect him. And then on top of that, you've got Benjamin Netanyahu who comes in to address Congress. And in doing so, when he lands on United States soil, there is nobody of any relevance that's there to greet him. What's the excuse? President Biden is sick. He's just recovering from his 10-day recovery from COVID or whatever it is. You've got Kamala Harris who's trying to be busy pretending to be the president who she'll never end up being unless we actually get careless and get really stupid about the way we handle this whole situation. And then on top of that, you begin to see that what looks like the whole stinking world falling apart. Let me go over some of these news articles that came across the, the, the pipe over just the last week. And then on top of that, you got stories like this one, radical UK Islamist preacher. This is, if you guys remember Mjum, you know who exactly what he's about. This guy is an absolutely terrible guy. I'm gonna play a little video of who he is and then I'll tell you what the rest of this story looks like. Uh, and, and how's the uh, campaign to move Britain over to Sharia law coming along? Well, this is in the hands of God. We mm. do our best Going to propagate well? Islam. Well, of course it is. I think many people will see that democracy and freedom is no good for the British, no good for Afghanistan. And in fact, we need an alternative. Unlike man-made law, the Sharia is not something which gives you a right today to take it away tomorrow. It's good in all times and places. What is I, yeah, yeah, sir, I, to make this an issue of freedom and democracy is absurd. Anjum, you haven't had a hair on your body touched by this government or this country. You haven't spent a day in prison. You haven't suffered one bit for your views. You're allowed to sit here right now because of freedom and democracy. In your so-called caliphate, you'd have me killed, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you have me... Am I an apostate that deserves death? Oh, uh, under your yeah. caliphate, he would be executable, would he? He would be judged uh, by right. an Islamic judge. Okay. And then after that... And you hear what Mjem said? This is Mjem, by the way five or six, maybe even eight years ago, talking about how the UK would be a better place if it was ran by Sharia law. Folks, that's how crazy he is, and yet he has been arrested again. That's what the article says. And look at the title of this. It says, Radical UK Islamists Convicted of Terrorist Offenses. And folks, I'm telling you right now, Enjum continues on and on and on and on and on to do the kind of insanity that he's always been doing. And that's not what's so unique about this story. But what's unique about this story when you read it is there's a lot of people that are rallying for him. There's a lot of people that think, oh, this is great. This is a wonderful thing. There's nothing wrong with this. This is, this is what it should be. And we see story after story. How about what happened with the Yemenis? What happened with the Houthis? Think about this. Yemen made a directed and concerted attack towards Israel. They did it with a drone. The stories, by the way, of how the drones got to Israel are absolutely unbelievable. And Israel reciprocated by destroying any ability that they had on the coast of the Yemeni region to be able to do anything that they tried to do in the first place. And this bombing involved manned pilots in actual Israeli Air Force aircraft flying, doing this mission, which means they had to have coordinated their attacks with not just Saudi Arabia, but they had to have coordinated their attacks with people who have sovereignty in the Red Sea area, including the United States of America, and perhaps most importantly, the Russian Federation, which means we are beginning to see the assembly of all of the things that we hear about and read about when we look at Ezekiel chapter 38. And all of this stuff continues on. Every bit of this stuff is happening more and more and more and more. We're seeing it materialize and it feels like it's helpless. It feels like the world is getting darker. It feels like everything around us is literally collapsing. I mean, when you think about all of these, how about this? How about the Israeli parliament has now voted, which by the way, I say praise God for this. The Israeli parliament has now voted to call UNRWA 
a terror organization. And they should. I think the largest terrorist organization in the world is the United Nations. And UNRWA is a function of the United Nations. And it's amazing to me how the world is kicking and screaming, even though tons of members of UNRWA who were members of Hamas were the ones that helped murder and kidnap all of these precious Israeli lives. And folks, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Look at how crazy things are beginning to get between the UN and between Israel. Look at this tweet here. This is an absolutely crazy tweet. UNRWA says, we are paying the price for having been vocal in drawing attention about the plight of the people in Gaza, of this humanitarian disaster unfolding on our watch. They have no idea, by the way. <laughs> I just want you to understand. They have no idea what they're calling the plight. They don't understand Islamic culture. They don't understand uh, Hamas. They don't understand the Arabs. They don't understand any of that stuff. And I like how Israel responded. Look at the tweet. No, UNRWA, you're paying the price for employing literal murderers. And it's true. Now, it's easy to get depressed over all of this. It's easy to be bothered by it. It's easy to be distraught by everything that you're seeing. But this is where we begin to find peace. And this is where we begin to find semblance in all of it. God told us it would happen. God has constantly given us story after story after story after story. He's given us word after word after word. He's given us understanding after understanding, discernment after discernment of the things that we should be expecting and the things that we know should be coming. And he even warns us to hold fast to what we know is true and to remain in a way that pleases him throughout the difficult times that we continue to experience. Look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And by the way, folks, this Thursday, I'm going to do a study on this and it deals with everything Bible prophecy. But look what he says. He says, but of the times, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. By the way, he just finished talking about the rapture. He's just finished talking about what is going to lead to the start of the end of the world. And we're getting close to that time. He says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. By the way, travail upon a woman with, with child is a very powerful phrase. It means one day you're going to feel like it's okay. The next day it's going to be pain like you can't even imagine. That's what it's talking about. But you, brethren, notice this, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. But you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Here it is. Here's the command. Therefore, let us what? Let us not sleep as do others. So we're not supposed to sleep. Stay awake. But here it is. Let us do two things. Number one, let us watch. We have to do that first. Keep our eyes open. But the watching that you do isn't going to mean anything. Not one lick if you don't stay sober. And when I talk about sobriety, folks, I'm not talking about staying away from alcohol or drugs, although that's very important. What I'm talking about is the number one thing that will rip you off of every last bit of sobriety you have ever had is sin. So walk in purity. Because when you begin to see the data in front of you and you begin to understand what's going on, you, as you remain with your sobriety, as you stay sober, you will be able to understand what it is you're watching. And you will understand what's going on. Why? Because he says this in verse seven, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night, but let us who are of the day, notice this, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. In other words, keep close to the Lord during these times. Why? Because when you're close to the Lord, it does several things for you. Number one, it keeps you sane. Number two, it gives you the strength to do the things that you know you need to do. Number three, it gives you purpose. It helps you to understand the importance of the journey that you're taking. And number four, it gives you the strength necessary to carry yourself through this and your family and the people around you. And number five, and most importantly, 
it gives you the victory, understanding that God already has the victory, that you may not be overtaken as a thief would overtake you in the night. Because you're a children, you're a child of God. You are the children of righteousness, and we can see it coming. So, folks, when you see these headlines and you look at these stories, understand something. God is good, and his faithfulness will never, ever be broken, and his victory is sweet. So keep fighting the good fight and watch God do the work that I know he's already doing. God bless you.